Welcome to the Tribe of Testimonies. Here you will find conversations with faithful Native American members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, sharing their stories and their love of the Savior. My name is Andrea Hales. I'm Navajo, and I'm glad that you've decided to come and join us today. Last week, I posted part one of Brother Sonny LaFontaine, and I this is the first time there's been a two-part episode, but um, he just shared what was in his heart and what he felt prompted to share, and so last week is part one, today is part two, and if you haven't heard part one, maybe you should go listen to it. I'm so grateful for this time with him. This is Brother Sonny LaFontaine. Um, so, okay, so getting back from the mission, I, I get married to, uh, I, I meet a, a, uh, a girl that I used to know when I was younger. I used to tease her, right? She used to be my friend's girlfriend, and I used to bug her, but I also liked her. I used to tease her, so when I got back from my mission, I started dating, not just her, but a couple other women that I knew. Uh, old girlfriend and an old friend and then her and I was just you know kind of dating all three trying to figure out who I was supposed to be with and and I know this I knew I knew it was her for some reason but I knew that I had to go into the temple and go into the celestial room and ask um because my mom didn't really like her you know my mom liked this other woman that, well this other girl that I was dating so I brought these women around my family to see how well they got along with my family because I love my family I'm gonna I know I'm starting another family you know and I need to stay with them but in my in my mind I always saw my family being with my other family for the rest of my life closeness and everything like that you know, and so that's why I brought them around my family. And my wife did not really get, she, she got along with my wife and my mom somewhat, but not as, not like I thought they would, you know, because, you know, in the movies, you see your, your, your mother-in-law is like your, she's like your daughter, your mother's law turns into your mom and the mother's or the mother-in-law is the daughter you know something like that I thought it would be but not wasn't the case so I I go to the temple I pray about my wife and I get the answer and then um I'm telling my mom what's going on and I could tell she doesn't like it you know and I haven't proposed to my wife yet but she knows, everybody knows I'm going to. And I pulled my mom aside and I said, Mom, uh, if you can't get behind my decision to marrying this woman 100%, I'm, I'm, and you tell me not to marry her, I'm not going to marry her. I, that's how much I thought of my mother and her and what she and how she felt. And she said, you know, asked me if I prayed about it. I said, yes. I said, I prayed about it in the, in the celestial room in the temple. And that's, that's the answer I got. She's like, well, if that's the answer you got, then you go with the answer. And that's how she left it. And me and, me and my wife got married in 2004 in the Orlando Temple. You know, and we just celebrated 20 years of being married this year. And um, after we got married, we built a house over in Middleburg, which is about 25 minutes away from my parents' house. It was in Orange Park. And we got going, we got started as a family. I started working with my dad in his business and things were going great. We had a, our first daughter, Savannah. She's going to be 19 this year. She already graduated high school, but we had a young family. And I was working out with the weights and going to work and we were, you know, young family, active in church. 
um, we had callings, and then I, I got hurt. I got hurt lifting weights, and it was back in oh four, oh five, oh six. I got hurt, and back then, if you get a paper cut, they give you freaking painkillers if you have wanted them, you know. And that's what happened with me. I got hurt, and I went to the doctor, and they gave me some opioids, and I. I got opioid, opioid dependent. So I started taking them. And then I started taking them when I didn't need to take them because they felt good. And then it, go, it kept on going and going and going. It got harder and harder on um, my family, me and my wife and kids. And then it got even harder on my father who had the business because I, I started taking things, started, t- started stealing money and items to feed my addiction and they got they got bad i mean i i think in you know you're, you're talking years of uh just drugs and alcohol um from 2006 to my sobriety date is may 25th 2013 so this last year this past may i celebrated 11 years sober i fought drug addiction in and out of rehabs, detoxes, and then alcoholism came in. Because my grandfather, who is my dad's dad, Mel LaFontaine, he's an AA. And I have his first AA book. My grandma gave it to me when at his funeral when he died. He actually, in the rooms we say he died a winter because he died sober. He died 30 years sober. You know, but then we have my mom's grandfather, my mom's dad, Grandpa Charlie, who died and he he died in a car wreck when I was younger, like when it, like maybe a year or two after my grandma died. Whenever we had his funeral, I didn't know if he was drinking or driving or not. You know, I can't say that. But I know my grandfather, my dad's dad, he was AA and he died sober. So he lived in Utah still and he would come back to Florida as a winter bird. Uh, I don't know if you know what that is. It's whenever they the winter comes and the people live in these snow areas, they, they leave and they migrate as a people to like a summer state, and they'd come to Florida. And they had a fifth wheel. They'd park it at my house, and he'd try to get me sober and take me to meetings. And yeah, he did it for three or four or five years straight every winter time. You know, trying to help out, trying to see, you know, help me stay sober. And every year he'd pack up, unavailed, you know, not able to help me. You know, mind you, I'm working as much as I can. My wife, she had to get a job to help with ends meet because of my addiction and my drinking. The church, you know, I would go to like some of the church AA stuff, but it all, none of it mattered because I wasn't ready at that time to get sober, you know. I did, I did cause a really big issue with with my family amongst amongst my family and friends because of my dishonesty that happens whenever you're drinking and drugging. The spirit wasn't as prominent in my life because of the the, the drinking and drugging, the pain. You know, in, a, in AA we learn that we don't. There's there's a reason why we drink. There's something unresolved in our life, right? That that happened something there's something that's causing us to engage the first drink my story whenever i came back to whenever i started really looking at the the big picture with myself and why i was drinking i went to aa and with my grandfather and people welcomed me and they were nice to me but i just wasn't ready and the time that i was ready was whenever everybody thought i was ready you know, we're having, me and my wife are having kids at this time, here and there. And at this time, we have three kids. This is probably, I don't know, three or four different AA, not AA, but um, detoxes or rehabs. You know, the rehabs I went to, there were 60 days, sometimes 65. So not only am I not around my family, my wife's having to pick up the slack for work, too, if that makes sense. And to be a, a woman and I'm pretty much a single mom when I'm not there. 
You know, my oldest son learned how to walk when I was in, you know, in one of the rehabs I was in. So my first two oldest, I was actively drinking and drugging. My last two, I was some, I, I was sober. That makes sense. So my first, my boy and girl, my girl boy, our first oldest, I was active in my addiction. And then my last two, I, I got, I sobered up. The last time I drank, it was, it was bad. I mean, it was, it was bad for where I had to drink just to stop feeling horrible. Not, not like physical or spiritual. I mean, obviously that was horrible, but like physical, you know? Like trembling and I had to wake up. I woke up in the middle of the night, had to drink to go back to sleep. It was it was that it was at that point where I was a chronic alcoholic. One day, my dad had enough of it, and he, my grandfather, was always telling my dad to fire me, to 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 leave me alone, to wash his hands of me, you know. And that's the only way he's going to get sober. He has to find a bottom that's uh, tough enough for him to get sober. And unfortunately for some of us, that, that bottom is death. Some of us can never stop drinking, and some of us have to die, which is a scary fact. And I didn't know that until I became a member of AA, and I've seen it with people, from people, with my own eyes. And it just, it just, it just, it kills you. It kills, it kills you as an individual who's sober, who wants to help someone and knows that that person is, is just not the one that to, to, to get sober. But he could. And I was that person. So, you know, fast, backtracking to whenever my grandfather was around, the last time he left my house, he never gave me an AA book. You know, and the last time he left, you know, he's pulling out the driveway and, you know, he's aggravated, I can tell. I mean, anybody who knows my grandfather knows how he is. <laughs> so, so I'm like, hey, man, you know, I went over there and I talked to him. He's just getting ready to leave, and he's like, he gets in his truck, and he hands me a big book. He goes, you're the alcoholic that has to die. And then he says, but I pray you're not, you don't have to. You know, when he said that, hey, be quiet, Elsa, Elsa, stop. So when he said that, I, I didn't really think anything of it, you know, I was just like, okay, old man, whatever. I took his book and went back to my house and threw it in on the couch and went about my business. Fast forward on from that, from, you know, that experience with my grandfather. I, uh, and him telling my dad, I have to, I have to really be shown the hard way, which is tough love all the way. And I end up getting fired from my dad. And my dad goes, we were working on some high rise condos in Jacksonville. And he took me out to the balcony. And of course, I've been stealing stuff from the company and, you know, not coming in on a good time and drinking and this and that. And I end up, he ends up taking me outside on the balcony and says, he gave me, he fired me. And then after he fired me, he just went down the list. I don't want you coming to my house. I don't want you coming over family dinner. Me and your mom don't want to see you. But he said, your kids and your wife are welcome, but you're not. And I was devastated, you know. And as, as an alcohol, as an alcoholic, you know, who who can you turn to? Who do you turn to? You know, I'm not going to turn to the Savior. I'm not going to read my scriptures. I'm not going to pray. I turn to alcohol because that's what I am. I'm an alcoholic. I'm an alcoholic, an active alcoholic. So that's what I did when I left the job. I grabbed me a couple bottles. Then went on a bender for a while. At that time, I, I didn't know what to do. So I called my wife. I told her what happened. And I apologized. 
and I was talking crazy. I was talking so much crazy, I scared her that she thought I was going to commit suicide. And she called, in Florida, we have what's called a Baker Act. So if a, if a spouse thinks you're going to harm yourself, they can call the police and the police will come get you. And they'll put you in a, in the hospital, which is the psych ward. And they'll help you, help, help you to get better. And that's what they did. They, they came and got me. Well, they couldn't find me. So I'm parked over at like this Walgreens drinking. And I keep hearing these cop cars zooming back and forth up and down the road. You know, just nonstop. I'm like, what the hell are these guys doing? You know, so, and I'm drinking and my sister calls me and I keep sending everybody to the voicemail. I don't want to talk to anybody. I just want to drink. Right? So I finally answered. She's like, Sonny, where are you? You know, this is my oldest sister. You know, her and I used to be really close. So we had a falling out. And um, she lived here in Florida. So I answered the phone. She's like, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, I'm just drinking. And I'm like, I uh, screwed up this and that. I'm all crying, you know. Poor, poor, poor me. And um, so I end up telling her where I was, and she came and got me. And luckily, right as she came, she grabbed my keys from me. And then, like, because the cops had my description of my vehicle, right? And they finally find me, like, as she's, like, talking to me. And they come up, and they're just like, oh, hey, you know, we're looking for you, this and that. They're like, so she has my wife on the phone, and they're like, "You want the keys in the car?" Because they they give you your wife the keys are in the car. Um, so she takes me home, and the cops there. The cops talk to my wife, and she's like, "Yeah, you I, you need to take them." And you know, I'm 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 intoxicated, so I go with. They come up and they go, hey, you know, trying to be all nice. They think you should come with us. They think you should come with us. And I said, you know what, fine, I'll go with you guys. And I went with them and and that started my, that, that, that finally feeling of just saying, you know what, fine, I'll go with you guys. I need help. That was my very first step into, re, into a true recovery. And then I went to the the funny farm i say and my wife said that you call me because you can make calls when you're in there she's like you call me you were so mad at me for putting in here and i was but as i was in there and my body's suffering from withdrawals and my mind's going much with all the pressure that has coming from losing a job and everything else and all those emotions that i keep at bay with alcohol i what do i do I finally kneel. I finally kneel down and pray in the room by myself. I finally, I finally asked for help. You know, I got that feeling that that feeling I had. You know, when my grandmother told me it was going to be okay. Feeling of relief and um. I got out of it was was released from uh, the hospital, and I ended up going to AA. And they knew me in AA, and I told them I was wanted to needed a sponsor, and that I was ready to work the steps and be honest. And you know, they knew me around in, in my home group, so I was the guy who would come in, get sober for a little bit to get people off his back, right? And then I'd go back out, sneaky, right? So I was that guy. I wouldn't really stay around and have true sobriety. Um, so I got a sponsor and he, he was a great sponsor. You know, he fixed my car every time I would drink and drive. You know, he was a body guy. Um, part of my story first though, I apologize, was uh, two years beforehand, I was drinking and driving and I, I crashed my vehicle into a tree going 55 miles an hour, my work van. And it was at three, almost three o'clock in the morning and it caught fire. 
and it was and I was face down on the passenger side and a lady was pulled over. She was already on the phone with the paramedics to call. They they didn't know I was in there. The lady, this guy, you know, he saved my life. He, she uh, you know, his name is Jason. He she didn't know I was in there. And he pulls over and he, he was telling me that, you know, he doesn't he doesn't normally drive down that road at that time of night, and he just did. And he was on the driver's side of the car, and there was smoke coming in already from the fire. And he didn't see me. And then from on the other side, he didn't see me. And he, just as he's getting ready to step away, he sees the back of my neck. And he says, there's somebody in there. The door's locked. So then he busts out the window with the trailer hitch, unlocks the door. And it pulls me out and saves my life. I was cut up and had some burn marks on me. You know, and I was laid up in the hospital for over a week. And of course, I had people come and visit me, and my wife crying, and I'm crying. And I'm still, you know, intoxicated. And I'm never going to drink again. I'm never going to drink again. And I, uh, Call my grandfather and he's on the phone and I told him, Yeah, I'm never gonna drink again, I'm never gonna drink again. And so I almost died, right? He hears me crying and whining and he says BS and he hangs up on me. Cause he knows the type of alcoholic I am. And only somebody from AA and that is part of AA would know what I'm talking about. So he moves on, you know. That's what he told me. He said, BS, he hung up on me. And then I go, you know, I, I like, I like people, you know, taking pity on me being in a wreck. So what do I do? I go to every clubhouse in my area, tell my story. You know, I'm wearing a brace neck around my neck because my neck's jacked up and my hair's singed off parts of it, you know, and I'm got some scabs on my face from my wreck. And I tell my story that I had a great awakening. You know, I got in this wreck. I almost died. Someone saved my life, and I'm never going to drink again. Did that three different groups, and finally, someone told me. Some one of the old timers said, "You know what that would tell me after he after I shared, and everybody else shares, right?" And um, and he was just like, "That would tell me I could drink no matter what. I can't die." And I started thinking about that statement. Thinking about that statement. And uh, from the day I was out the hospital, to the day I finally started drinking again was under a week. Oh wow! So even death and scared and, and, and being scared straight did not work for me. But keep in mind, whenever I got out of the hospital, I never thanked the Lord for saving my life. I never prayed. I never did any of that. I didn't have a spiritual awakening. And it was only after all this that happened. That I was in the hospital with my wife, you know, having my wife commit me, that I finally knelt down and prayed and I had that spiritual awakening. And that's when I had, that's when I, I had the real opportunity to get sober and stay sober. And that's what, that's what did it for me. You know, that's when I had enough is enough. And I think my grandfather knew that. Because when I got out of the hospital, I called him. And I said, Grandfather, you know, I just got out of the hospital. And, um, you know, people are wondering and want to know, what am I going to do? Am I going to go to a rehab? Am I going to do this? Am I going to do that? And he says, he goes, Sonny, you know what to do. Just do it. And I knew, I knew what to do. And I knew what to do. I knew to do. For me, I had to go to AA, I had to find a sponsor, I had to work the steps, I had to be honest, I had to change everything. And I knew I could do, if I did that, get back into church, you know, um, I could get sober and stay sober. And I did. You know, started going back to church, 
you know, started being active in my board, took my family, started going back to church because I fell away from the church. You know, you know, it says in the scriptures, it's hard to serve two masters. I, you know, I can contest. I, I can definitely say that that's true. You know, at least for me, it was until I got to the part where, you know, Alma the Younger talks about you know, being past feeling. And then I got to that part too in my spiritual journey to where I was past feeling. But for me, it means that I could do evil and not feel that I was doing evil no more. That the spirit, the spirit has completely left me, left from me. Um, that is, that was a horrible feeling to be like that. You know, cause we we read that the light of Christ is in everybody, right? And then if you're a member of our church, a member of the church of Jesus Christ that are saints, you have the light of Christ. And then also when you read the when you become a member of the of the church, of his church, you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost and the companionship of the Holy Ghost. And then with the companionship of the Holy Ghost and reading your scriptures and making more covenants. You know, after baptism, you know, going to the temple like I did, you know, I had I had more responsibility and more consequences on me from going to the temple and everything else that I agreed to that it was hard for me to finally go into the bishop's office and to fully repent from all my past transgressions. Because of all the shame and guilt that happens from it. And, you know, when I finally did, it was, it was a whole opening. It was a whole new life that felt like um, a huge burden off my shoulders. I, I owe my, all my life to the program Alcoholics Anonymous because not only did it recenter me with my family, you know, physically, but it, it, it put me back on my spiritual path that I was on already. And it helped me get back in touch with the Savior, Jesus Christ, and to do what he wants, to do his work, if that makes sense. You know, to raise my family in the gospel. Because whenever I was out there running the streets and doing what I was doing, my family was suffering, not just physically, but also spiritually. You know, not going to church for many years, me not praying as a family, you know, my my kids not, you know, participating in, in some of the church activities and stuff. It, it takes a toll on family. I've tried to learn more about my heritage in these last few years to pass on to my kids because, you know, the, a couple of years ago, my youngest daughter, she she was an element, she was in kindergarten, and they were talking about Thanksgiving, and I'm like, well, you know, your your ancestors were were American Indians, part of this whole, you know, Thanksgiving celebration. She's like, what? She's like, no, we're white. And I'm like, no, because you know, my wife was white. You know, she just tans really well. That makes sense, and she has dark hair. So you know, my my kids are actually. I don't know, 33% American Indian. So I didn't teach my kids my culture, which, you know, it's, that, that's, that's an issue for me. I, I really beat myself up about that. Because for me, that's, that's something I change and I try to teach them now. But going back to, um, Hey, hey, you're finally getting sober. You know, getting sober and, and living this life of, you know, soberness and and trying to do the right next thing and having a family and a business and all this other stuff and all these other trials. You know, I've learned one thing and, and that the Lord is not going to give me more of the burden than I can handle. Over these last, from my sobriety on to about, I said I have 11 years, about I wasn't sure if I was going to talk about this, but I will for a little bit. About three and a half, four years ago, 
I had an incident where let's just say I had to repent for some stuff that I did. And as well in my wife, I almost got excommunicated because of what I did. And this is that I'm sober. I'm a sober, you know, and we're still having, I still have this family, but I, you know, had did something really, really stupid. I had to repent from it because it just ate at me for so long and I carried it so bad. And I was so scared that I was going to get excommunicated and what everybody was going to think, you know? And so what did I do? I just pushed it down the road. My sponsor knew about it, right? About what I did. Um, I'll just say what it was. It was infidelity. He was really pissed off. And I said, well, what do I got to do? He's like, well, I should, you know, should I tell my wife? He goes, no, you need to talk to your, talk to you. Cause he knew well, what, meant, what church I belong to. So I talk to your, your bishop, your pastor, and we'll go from there. And I was like, okay. So I kept pushing it down the road. And then when I finally got the courage to do it, COVID happened. And you remember when COVID happened, no one went to church or no one did anything, you know? So I just kind of sat on my hands until about two years ago. And that's when a little over two years ago is when I met with my, my bishop. And then I met with my state president. I told him what happened. I said, this is what happened. You know, I've changed, I changed my behavior. Um, I said, I really, this is what's holding me back from the savior. And I want to make things right. And he, he's like, does your wife know? I said, I said, no, but I think so. I said, but it's going to kill her because this woman has stood by me the whole time I was drinking and drugging. Finally get sober. I'm sober for five, you know, seven, eight years. And then I do this to her. I said, I said, and if she divorces me, I understand. I completely understand. I said, and if I get executed, I understand. I said, but I just cannot, I cannot face me. I can't stand before him. And he said, uh, okay. Long story short, he, he was, he was praying over it many different times. And we kept meeting each week. Um, my wife found out, we talked, she was really pissed off. Of course, what, what wife wouldn't be. She didn't kick me out whenever we were working, whenever we talked about it. She, you know, man, it was, it was hard. It was hard for me as, as far as, uh, to see that much pain I caused that woman. And then to see that other, this, this other, this is another type of pain. Unless you've experienced it or been part of it, you, you won't know what I'm talking about. And I don't know why I'm sharing this part of my story because this is like not a lot of people know about it. A lot of some of my family members know about it. My mom and dad obviously know about it, but the pain that woman has endured just so we can have the blessings of an eternal family, I'll be forever grateful. You know, after she, after we found out or she found out we're working on healing as a family the state president meets with her and he sees angry and she tells him what she thinks and this and that and and he goes he meets with her for like an hour and a half and then i come back inside and just gets our both of our you know what we feel and we both feel like we want to work it out. And then we start family therapy. And we have a great therapist, not from the church. We did. We tried the one from the church and she didn't really work out with my wife. And then we started this other one that I used to see a while ago. And it worked out really well with her. Mm -hmm. And that's that's how my wife was able to heal with, with this therapist. And and um myself as well and the last 
the last time I went met with the state president to get my version, so I'm supposed to be um, excommunicated. I walked in his office and I was not nervous at all. I, I have no clue why. I mean, I know why now, but at the time, I did not know why I was not nervous and not running away from the consequences of my actions. And, you know, I uh, I felt a peace. And then I went in and then he told me, he said, you know, for this, for what you've done, this is what normally happens. He goes, and, and I've been praying with the Lord many different times and I keep getting the same answer. And the same answer is not to excommunicate you. And he just is like, I've done, I, I've, I've already excommunicated somebody this year for the for less than what you have done. He goes, but this is not the promise the Lord has made with your people. In the Book of Mormon, when I read, you know, different accounts. When the Lord talks to different, you know, individuals. You know, the one that I really like and get along with, that, that I, that I, I guess personalized with more, more is, uh, it's Enos, you know, he talks about how he went to go hunt beasts in the field. And, uh, the, uh, the teachings of his father weighed heavy on his heart and on his mind. And he prayed unto the Lord. You know, all day and all night. And he said he finally had the, uh, he said the Lord came upon him and said, uh, you know, he just told him he was forgiven of his sins and that the Lord will not remember them no more. And that he also would be shown what his father was shown, you know, and would be blessed. You know that that's uh that was, that was amazing when I first read that. You know, and to continue to read the Book of Mormon and go back and forth to the stories and some of the promises that are made. Um, and I believe that the Book of Mormon is for our people. Mm -hmm. So, for me, when the Lord. When he promises those people, like Enos and the other people that he talks to in the Book of Mormon, you know, I uh, I feel like that promise is for me. You know, it's an amazing feeling. So, you know, going back through my life and being 42 right now and raising the church. Going on a mission, being married, falling into addiction and uh, drug drug addiction and alcoholism. Now it's just alcoholism. You know that's what it came to at the end, and then overcoming that, and then having a great life, and then falling in temptation again, and almost losing everything again. And then, I mean, this is only two and a half years later that I'm back at where it almost feels like at the beginning again, you know? And then, you know, we're, me and my wife are currently working on receiving our temple recommends. And wow, what, what a feeling it's going to be to finally be able to go back into the lower house. I don't know. It, it, it's just, I'm just at awesome times on how quick the Lord is to forgive. Hey, Elsa, how quick the Lord is to forgive our past transgressions, you know, if we come to him, you know, with the, he tells us, you know, when we come to him with a contract heart, a broken spirit, you know, how quick he is to forgive, it's just amazing, you know, and then I don't know why I have to learn lessons so hard so many different times, you know. This last time, going through everything we went through, and my putting my wife through everything we've been through, and these life experiences, I 
I, I'm, I'm, there's no doubt in my mind that Jesus Christ is the Savior, and that His atonement is all the compass, compass everything. You know, He suffered all. And the promises I made with Him the last time I prayed, and for me and my family, pray for my family to get over. You know, some of the things that we've been through. Yeah, I'll never plan on ever breaking those promises I made with him again. But that's my story. Well, I do have the the final question I'd love to ask you. What does it mean to you to know that you belong to the tribe of Israel? Like I said with my last, with what I said about the Book of Mormon, that that I, I believe and I know that those promises that he made with those individuals in the Book of Mormon, if they chose and, and chose to not only make the covenants, but also keep the covenants, that they would be blessed and that their seed and prosperity would be blessed also. I believe that that promise still to this day exists. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm reaping fruits of that promise. Like being able to be raised in the church and go on a mission. I'm reaping the benefits of that promise in my in my everyday life of knowing the Savior. You know, and knowing that the Book of Mormon is was a, was written for us and was written about our people. That's something that is as a youth growing up that I was kind of embarrassed of, you know, being American Indian. I really didn't understand how Amazing and blessed and great that is. Feeling it that it's a burden to not be proud of it, you know. But to now know what it means, you need to be proud. That's that's an amazing feeling. You know, there's a there's a there's a couple of things that that really get me emotional when it comes to my, my heritage and it's just you know talking about my grandmother and all that the, the past experiences but even now when i go to a, 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 a native festival or a powwow and just you know i'm around the circle the drum circle or or i hear you know the drum start beating. So that that uh, I don't know. It's just that feeling of of belonging. You know, that just being a part of the people. So, yeah, that that's, that really gets my heart going. You know, and and I understand why some natives don't embrace. It's hard for them to embrace Christianity and like I'm on some of these like different Facebook groups and a lot of them are hateful against, you know, the colonization of the Americas and Christianity being forced down the throat, you know, and they're just, there's just so much hate, you know, from our people towards that. And I understand why, because of what happened and what transpired, you know, like for example, I'll just share a real quick story. So, my uh, my parents are part of a nonprofit, you know, the Phoenician ship, mm-hmm. uh, and they were invited up to D.C. to be um, have a dinner gala at the Tunisian house and to be represented and to be to show what it is and this and that. And we, we were made my wife went with them, and we went up to D.C. with them. And we went to uh, the American History Museum, the new one that goes up there. I don't know if you've ever been from there yet, but it commemorates American Indians in our culture and pop culture and some of the things that they sold with, like, you know, our logos, logos on them and stuff like that. And um, they had one room off to the side that we went through, and it was... Uh, it was custard's custard the battle of little bighorn and it had real 
warrior regalia that they wore on stands and glass. It was really cool, you know. And then it went through different like, like what happened, the history of it, the cause of it, why it happened. Um, and it's just like a little walk through. You walk through it, you know. You learn a little bit about it, and I do quite a bit of the history already. And but I started getting really, really angry. And I started getting really, really uncomfortable. And I'm the kind of guy that doesn't like to cry in front of people a lot, you know? Mm-hmm. But then I do cry in front of a lot of people. I don't know. It's weird. So I end up leaving uh, the museum and I go sit outside. And my wife's looking for me and she finds me. I know she's supposed to be my soulmate, my eternal companion, because she knows me to the T. You know, I'm sitting out there by myself, and I got my sunglasses on, and she's like, she's like, what's wrong? I said, uh, I'm like, no, nothing's wrong. She's like, rather like that. She's like, what's wrong? I just told her, I said, you know, the, you know, just the massacres. And the hardship that our people had to endure. I can see why so many people still have hate in their heart. I said, I'm sitting outside, I just, and she just rubbed my back, and I just, I bowed my, my head, and I, you know, I pray for comfort and relief, and I get it, you know, from the spirit, but. A lot of our brothers and sisters don't have that. You know, they haven't been they haven't been shown the gospel. They haven't been shown the part to not not to forget, but to forgive and to move forward because of the past and what happened. That's that's that would be my message to those who don't, who haven't done that, you know, or feel like they can't do that. And that's where the gospel comes in. That's where a relationship with Jesus Christ comes in, where you're able to overcome, you know, ill feelings like that from the past, or even ill feelings that you might have for the, of people today. Is that you know you turn to the Lord and He He'll be able to help you overcome all, because He has been able to overcome all. He did overcome all. You know He made promises towards our to our people, and I know that I know from personal experience that they stand for, and they're, they exist to this, to this day, and I'm I'm proof of that, and my family's proof of that also. I agree. Thank you so much, Sunny. Our neighbor passed away. He's about our age. He's not old. And I am so grateful for his influence. And I am grateful for the way his family have walked in faith. Their influence has made a difference in my life. I just have been thinking the song, Have I done any good in the world today? And I feel like our neighbor did. That's all I want to leave with you today. For you to think about, have I done any good in the world? today and I hope you have a super wonderful awesome day Tribe of Testimonies is not sponsored by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints the music is a traditional hymn Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing arranged and performed by Kyle Forsyth I would love to hear from you I would love to hear how this podcast is affecting you and I'm always looking for guests If you or someone you know would be a great guest, 
you can reach me at tribeoftestimonies at gmail.com.